Um, so there was actually a pretty decent amount of activity um, this past week. I um, was doing from the 21st and then up to the 27th. Um, there were four non-directed uh, CMEs, not Earth direct say CMEs. Um, they were all C types. Um, and there were two Earth directed CMEs, also C types. The first one, um, Earth directed on the 21st, was about 850 kilometers per second. And uh, this one appeared to have merged with another CME that occurred on the 20th. Um, I apologize. That would have been mm -hmm. um, and then the second CME, uh, Earth directed, uh, was also C type, and it was 610 uh, kilometers per second. And this caused a shock arrival at ACE on the 26th of around mm. 437. Um, and there was another shock arrival uh, uh, that ACE detected um, on the 23rd at 110.22, another CME uh, earlier on the 20th. Um, uh, and then there was four solar flares that occurred. They were all uh, M class solar flares, and they were associated with actually. Uh -huh. Okay, so what what do you think in terms of you know space with their impact on actual you know technological systems? Was it you know big week or or, or uh, minor I mean, or? There was definitely a lot that happened, but nothing drastic. Okay. Um, besides the two shock rounds, I think there was stereo uh, pay. As well. Okay. 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 Okay, so activity, but nothing, you know, too extreme, yeah. at least. Okay, thank you, Erin. Let's see if we, you know, we're actually broadcasting here. Yeah. All righty. So uh, now we're we're ready to get going, Bill. So uh, really, the the floor is yours. Uh, if, if you, I mean, Bill, if you don't mind, you know, as you get started, you know, just saying a couple words, you know, how, how did you end up doing weather predictions and why, why did, why did you uh, make a transition to the dark side to start doing the space of the predictions, you know, uh, when you did? Yeah, yeah no, it's a, it's a good question and um, it's always good to, to say a few things just because people tend to hear the accent a little bit and they say, where did this guy come from, you know, so it's, it's kind of a watered-down Irish accent. I, I grew up in Ireland, but I had U.S. citizenship when I joined the, uh, the U.S. Air Force um, at 19 years of age. I spent 20, 20 years in the Air Force, so my career in the Air Force was, in fact, in uh, meteorology for the best part of 15 years. But in, um, I don't know if anyone in there has any background in the Air Force, uh, or especially Air Force weather, but in the Air Force weather, they, um, they don't have a separate career field for space weather, so they tap the meteorology community within the Air Force mm -hmm. to, to, to essentially volunteer, if you will, into, uh, into space weather. And um, I, in fact, was um, one of those volunteers, uh, for, I suppose largely because the duty assignment was the top of the Waianae Mountains in Oahu in Hawaii. Oh. So somebody, somebody waved that, uh, that opportunity in front of me. Uh, telling me that I, my job for uh, three years was going to be um, watching the sun rise and set in Hawaii. How <laughs> could I turn it that down? So, uh, as it turns out, there was a little bit more to it. There was it happened to be 1988 to 1991. So we had the big activity of the two cycles ago, the big 89 activity and whatnot. So I had fortunate. Uh, I was fortunate to work a lot of that activity from the obser observation standpoint. So my job was to to do the radio. Radio astronomy, monitoring frequencies, discrete frequency emissions from the sun, and understanding how it impacts, especially the national security systems. So that was kind of my introduction to space weather, and uh, I loved it. And uh, I went back into meteorology for a few more assignments. I was up in the remote island of Shimi and the Aleutian Islands for a while, and other places. But I wanted to get back into space weather. You know, I got tired of the first hundred thousand feet. I wanted to work the other ninety-three million miles, right? <laughs> so, uh, rest of the universe. <laughs> yes, exactly. So, um, yeah, so I got the opportunity to come to Boulder as an Air Force representative and the liaison uh, because of my space or the background between the Air Force and the DoD in large and NOAA, and um, did about four or five years as an Air Force person here, and uh, continued to love what I what I did and do. 
Uh, so transitioned into NOAA then back in 2003 as a space weather forecaster and then got through that for um, all about three or four more years before I became the program coordinator here. So that was kind of uh, the um, career progression. So okay. I tell people, I just, bad thing about this, I should have muted the phone here. You're probably hearing that. Sorry. But, um, sorry about that. So that kind of gives you my background. I, so I tell students often that um, I'm very fortunate. Auntie, I think you probably feel the same way that we're in a position and in a career field where it's like a hobby. We love what we do. Uh, if I had, I would do this for nothing. If I had money, I'd, if I won that big lottery the other day, I don't think I'd quit my job because I enjoy this field of space weather so much. So it's, uh, I think it's a uh, sentiment shared by many of my colleagues. In fact, it's an exciting career field with um, lots of opportunity, lots of growth, lots of things to learn still. So. Yeah. Now, should I, at any time during the presentation, obviously, um, jump right in with uh, questions for any yeah. of the students. Okay. Yeah. Should we go ahead and get started with the material? Yeah, go ahead. All right, how's that? Is everyone seeing that front slide? We were seeing your face. Oh, I failed miserably, sorry. I mean, it's very pleasant, but, but I think the slides <laughs> will be more helpful. Hold on, hold on. No patience with me here. Screen share. Desktop. Share selected window. All right. Better? Very good. Fantastic. All right, so the um, just a couple of comments right off the bat here on, on the opening slide here to give you a little bit of background. You'll see on the right-hand side that we are part of the National Weather Service. So where does this come from? Why is even within the Weather Service, a lot of people say, what's space weather doing in the Weather Service? And it dates back to, well, actually quite recent, 2005. Prior to 2005, we were part of the Office of Atmospheric Research. Uh, even though we had a operational responsibility for essentially decades, they, we actually are the, the origins of this organization date back to World War II, believe it or not, when it was recognized that space weather could impact the, the technology of the day, which was back then HF communications, high frequency communications, and radar systems. And uh, by the end of, the war, of World War II, there was already ionospheric services within U.S. government circles, and we essentially spawned out of that. But the last big transition occurred in 2005 when we transitioned into the National Weather Service. And I like to point that out to everyone, and, and I think in, everyone in the class has a good sense of this at this point, but the space weather issue has now uh, become a, a considerable concern for so many different sectors. And the very high and, and recognized at the very highest levels of government. So the alerts, warning procedures, etc., was recognized as it belonged more in the operational arm of NOAA, not the Office of Atmospheric Research, but that group, of course, responsible for alerts and warnings, which is the National Weather Service. So we officially transitioned into the National Weather Service in recognition of the growing importance of space weather and its impacts to our critical infrastructure and of course the growing importance of being alerted, warned, forecasting, etc. for this space weather phenomena. Um, now what I'm going to do today is um, try to break this talk into two, two different pieces. The first part I'm just going to focus on the customers. We have a kind of a unique perspective here that I always like to share at any opportunity uh, and, and that is the customer base. Uh, people just don't, won't see it as much as we do because we have that responsibility of providing these alerts and, alert, alerts and warnings. So on a daily basis, part of my job and a few of my colleagues here is coordinating with the many, many different and, and indeed growing 
a range of customers that are interested in this stuff. So I thought it would be good just to, to bring you into the forecast center, if you will, here by, by, um, by showing you some of the interactions, giving you some idea of the interactions we have with our customers. I try to tell Auntie that he needs to bring the whole class out to Boulder here, but um, funding just didn't allow that. Anymore. We would love that. Well, you, do you think Noah would support that financially? <laughs> We'd, we'd support it in, in spirit anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, so the first part then, I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, the solar cycle and customer growth. I always have to talk a little bit about the solar cycle. Again, everything I present here, you, you guys have already covered a lot of the science here of the solar flares and particle events, geomagnetic storms. I'm going to talk about that again to be a little bit of redundancy, but what I'm going to do is tie it into... Uh, impacts and customers and customer uses of the information. Uh, and then the second piece of the talk is, is the specific operations and alert and product procedures here at the Space Weather Prediction Center. Does that sound good? That's right. So, we had back in 2005, we, we introduced this product subscription service. You can see on the plot here the last solar maximum kind of that double hump back in 2000, 2001. And we, we had an extended solar minimum, 2007 to 2010 time frame. But in 2005, we introduced this product subscription service. And I, and I always found it so interesting to, even during those periods of 2008-9, when so little was happening on the sun, we were seeing steady growth of the customer base at a rate of maybe two to 300 every month signing up for these alerts and warnings. I suspected we'd see a, a, a considerable increase at, on that rate uh, as soon as the cycle started ramping up and as you can see that is in fact is in fact what happened. And now we're averaging about 800 to 900. I looked over just yesterday in fact, I looked at the past year and we're averaging about 940 new customers every month from around the world. So it's a free service. It's, something that um, a lot of people like. They can manage their own account, sign up for or, or, or um, the unregister for various um, various alerts and warnings as needed. Now you might ask, so what, Bill, what kind of customers are we talking about here? And this is just a nice snapshot to give you an idea of the cross-section of different types of sectors and industries and government types interested in space weather. What you will see here is the SES satellite, Inmarsat, so you see all the major satellite companies. In fact, somebody said to me recently, Bill, what, what satellite companies do you guys support in space weather? I said, well, all of them. Every single satellite company has to get the information on the environment they're operating their spacecraft on. If something happens, part of the assessments, part of the anomaly assessment, is to look at the space environment. You know that. So every single satellite company, I can look at this customer subscription service around the world, get this information. Emergency response community has become big. I'm going to talk in more detail about that. FEMA you'll see there. Anybody involved in aviation, whether you're building the plane, you're regulating the industry, you're flying the plane, all get alerts and warnings. You'll also see, of course, the big power plants, one of our biggest customers. Auntie and I work very closely with the North American Electric Liability Corporation and others in support of the needs of the power grid across this continent, indeed across the world, for space weather services. And you'll also see on there Caterpillar, John Deere, Washington State Department of Transportation. Why do you think you see those? Why, why is Caterpillar interested in this? GPS, right? Precision agriculture. The GPS, the GPS community, how do you call it a community? It's everybody, right? Everybody's using GPS one way or another these days, whether it's driving down the, the highway in your car, precision agriculture, like, the, like I pointed out here with Caterpillar, um, aviation, surveying, GPS now pervades society. I have a, a, a cute little story that I sometimes share 
on, on the use of GPS and, and, sp and space weather concern. And it's when I was up in Alaska last year interacting with some of the community customers up there, including the Depar Alaska Department of Transportation. And they shared a fascinating story with me that they have uh, some, they have snow plows, like we see down here on the lower 48. Um, one of the one of the passes, it's called Thompson Pass, and it goes into Valdez. I don't know if anyone's familiar with it, but it's a treacherous piece of road. It's the only way into that town of Valdez in the winter time, and they average like 500 inches of snow. So that means a lot of zero visibility, a lot of closure time on that road when the blizzards set in. But the State Department of Transportation arrive out with the snow plows clearing that road. They're relying on GPS. They're not even looking out the window of the snow plow. They're using new technology that pro projects the, G the GPS image onto that windscreen. And it's, it's got like centimeter accuracy. And if they veer too far left or too far right by about 10 centimeters, an alarm goes off. It's actually in a triple alarm system. They have an alarm to tell you an audio alarm that will beep if they're too far left or right and it's got a visual where there's a green LED a red light uh, telling you you're too far left or too far right. It's the third piece that amused me, amused me the most. It also has a, a vibrating seat that vibrates on the left side if you're too far left on the right side. So just in case you're falling asleep it will give you a little jolt. So. Anyway, these guys, it's kind of a life and death situation with them. They need to know if space weather is impacting the ionosphere to such a degree that that thing could be, if that thing is off a foot or two, they got some serious problems. So it was just uh, really interesting. And we're seeing that almost on a weekly basis here with various customers, various interests. We had this another guy calls a couple of months ago, and he is the manager of a golf course in California. and. Uh, of course, I took the opportunity to ask him, why do you need the, uh, to sign up for these our alerts? And he explains putting GPS in the golf carts. It's not oh, very good. Isn't that cheating? So I'm not sure it, it meets the PGA rules. However, it would suit me, uh, any of us, anyone like me who can never keep the ball in a fairway and spend most of the time in the woods. But So this guy was going to, just like if you go to a golf course, you see the sign with the weather conditions for the day. This guy was going to have a sign up for the ionospheric conditions or the GPS conditions if, uh, if we got an alert or a warning that the conditions could be bad. He wanted to let people know not to rely on that GPS or to be some lost golf balls, I guess. So Again, it's just like the gamut here of, of, of um, of uh, GPS uses, it's, it's quite remarkable. Any questions at this point? So, Bill, uh, these uh, these guys that uh, use GPS for you know plowing snow, essentially, are are are, are they getting uh, some uh, information about the atmospheric conditions, uh, you know, while they're driving? Or, I mean, how how does it work? How how do they get information that the GPS accuracy may have been compromised? Yes, they are getting the information um, beforehand. We will get the the forecast, the daily forecast. Uh, uh, and Auntie, I think you probably noticed that um, the uh, the way we're providing services for the Anisfer community is not where we want it to be just yet. Um, we're not able to. We're not specifying locally ionospheric disturbed conditions. So largely what we're relying on until we rectify that is the uh, geomagnetic storm conditions, which these people have told us are a pretty darn good proxy for ionospheric disturbances. When we do get into that K6, especially 7 and higher, they start seeing errors. So they're perfectly fine. When they get notification, they'll look at the forecast for planning purpose for the day. And if they see nothing's expected, that's great. Off they go. Um, if there's a probability for for something big to happen, or if we're expecting a CME or something to arrive, they'll judge. They'll you know they'll do they'll judge um, based on the prediction, the let the, the uh, intensity we're predicting, the time of the onset, etc. And then they'll get the warning uh, that something is happening, and they'll convey it to the uh, folks in the uh, that are doing the plowing and whatnot that conditions are starting to deteriorate. 
So they respond then to the alerts and warnings we get to them. So just a couple of things on the solar cycle, again keeping a, our perspective on things and how we have to deal with the customers and decision makers on this stuff. Um, I wanted to, to talk just a little bit about the solar cycle itself. So this is the prediction on the website, you're probably familiar with it, where we were predicting a solar maximum to occur, a sunspot maximum to occur in 2013 officially. It was May 2013, and you can see that red line is the predicted value. I'm not too confident. <laughs> Things may, in fact, be turning already. Um, there are already some suggesting out there that the solar maximum may, in fact, be more like a, what you're seeing there, a 60, 65 type maximum, um, and not as high. And the prediction of all, the prediction of a sunspot number up around 80 or so. Uh, it was going to be a low cycle to begin with, um, but it may in fact even come in lower uh, at this point. So what does that mean though from the operations standpoint? And this is something we have to try to communicate all the time because people just don't understand this space weather thing and they hear solar maximums coming in 2013 and they think things are going to happen right around the solar maximum that magical year of 2013, well of course that's not the case and we have a lot of responsibility in, 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 these, in our government agencies here to explain that in fact it's not the case that space weather can happen at any time and indeed with any size of cycle. And of course that's what I wanted to show you right here because when we look back at the past 250 years of sunspot cycles and you'll see the red dashed horizontal line reflects the average so you can see, in fact, the last six or seven cycles dating right back to the 1940s were at or above average. So things have been uh, pretty high. Uh, prior to that, we had a series of smaller cycles. Um, and certainly the cycle that if it does turn where it's turning right now, we'd have to go back to 1910 or thereabouts to, for a cycle of, of that size. But the point here is this. We, of course, in our business, and you guys know this by now, have a couple of major space weather events that have caught the attention of everyone and right up to the President of the United States, the 1859 and the 1921 storms. These were our kind of our space weather Katrinas. And you will notice, of course, that those storms that occurred back then occurred with cycles that were smaller than average. So while we may see less activity, at any time we could see one of those very large kind of rogue sunspot groups that could produce that one significant event uh, of consequence. Sometimes I liken it to the hurricane season where you know what's more important is a hurricane season with 20 hurricanes and none of them make landfall in the United States or that one season where you've got two hurricanes and they both make landfall in a category four or five. You know, so it's kind of the same thing here. We could, we could see that one or two significant earth directed CMEs that cause a magnetic storm similar to what happened in 1859 and 1921. And of course, Auntie, I'm sure, has talked about this in the class. This is what's garnered so much attention to uh, this issue of space weather in, in Congress and the White House and in and, 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 and Washington, period. Uh, the potential impact of a storm of that magnitude on the um, on today's technology could be very significant. Some suggest catastrophic, so it's, it's it causes people to to pay attention. The at 1859 storm, we have we actually have magnetometer data from the Q Observatory in London. Is what you're looking there at the green, and the, the 1921 storm. I, I bit of a history buff. I like looking back at what happened to the technology of the day and. 1921, it was interesting. I don't know if you, you, you mentioned this at all, uh, Auntie, but the um, check out the New York Times article there on the left hand side. During that big geomagnetic storm, the entire signal and switching system of the New York Central Railroad below 125th Street put out of operation, followed by a fire in the control tower at 57 Park. So even back then, these folks knew that this phenomenon could cause problems to the technology of today, of the day. And of course, the, the one other 
kind of proxy for the intensity of a geomagnetic storm is the southernmost extent of the beautiful northern lights. Back in 1921, one might have to wonder what the folks in Samoa and Jamaica and Cuba were thinking when they looked up in the sky and saw the brilliant aurora that far south. And that's where it was visible from. So it was an intense storm. And this is what a lot of folks are concerned about. Should a storm of that magnitude occur today, what would the consequence be to our critical infrastructure? Any questions? All right. Um, and, and, and when I'm on the subject of, of the, the smaller cycle, uh, I just wanted to point out sometimes you see a lot of attention focused on extreme, the extreme event. But even with these average sized storms, that's all we've had so far this cycle. I think we've got to go back to 2006 to, to look at the last big storm of any consequence. Um, but look at even, even a couple of times, several times this year, in fact, uh, we've had impacts. And again, this is what I want to share with you because we have to deal with this on an almost daily basis. Anytime we've got that K6, if you can look at the NOAA scales, one through five, we get one, two, three level storms, we are seeing impacts. When I visited CNN a couple of months back, they asked me, Bill, what do you, how would you rate our coverage of space weather? I said, you guys do a pretty good job. Well, where you're always wrong is when the storm is over and you say nothing happened. You're always wrong. And I have to explain this, that this stuff is not necessarily newsworthy, but it's happening all the time and we're dealing with it all the time. There's always impacts. So just to, to glance at a few of them from this year, for example, 7th of March, 2012, in SERFA, this is a Federal Aviation Administration, the FAA alerting service, and they got those three grades of alerts. Uncertainty is in SERFA, alert phase is, is alerta, and then the distress phase. Essentially it's this. If an aircraft is having a problem, or a suspected problem, you go into that first phase. If you get to that last phase, the aircraft is essentially down. 7 of March 2012, we went into the uncertainty phase with some flights. I'm pointing at one of them here to Vancouver to Tokyo, and that was because they could not communicate with the aircraft. I think there's some threshold, and if it extends past 30 minutes or so, uh, they, they issue this. They're, they're, they are concerned, they can no longer communicate with this aircraft, there may be a problem. Of course, there was a problem. The problem was space weather was interfering with communications. So, I mean, I guess, Bill, this flight was going over, over the cap, right? That's correct, Auntie. This was one of the polar flights, yeah. which I'll cover in a little more detail here in a bit. And just another, this is um, their quote, not mine, 6th and 7th of March, uh, same period. And this is flights, anti that were not over the poles. This was over the central west Pacific. And you can see they described that the air traffic communication groups described the impact on their communications as severe. At 2249Z, affecting first the central west Pacific. Uh, 25 air traffic control messages delayed. So their ability to tell an aircraft to move up or down or right or left is obviously impaired. In some cases impossible. They cannot communicate with the aircraft. Other things that happened back in that uh, particular storm of interest was the, you see the headline there, solar flare knocks out light squared satellite. So um, this particular satellite was, and by some descriptions, is the biggest um, communication satellite in the geo-orbit right now. And uh, it provides a lot of different services. I found out the problem was occurring from my colleagues in the emergency response community, in fact, down in Florida, who, I, who called me on that day on, in March and asked, Bill, is uh, any impacts is, is on satellites? Because we're having problems with our satellite phone system. I said I hadn't heard anything yet, and the following day the guy gets back with me and he says, it's okay, we've confirmed that it was space weather. I said, well, that's great. Tell me how you confirmed it. And he said that because the satellite company told them. So they uh, shared that email with me, in fact, and we were able to 
look into it a little bit. And that particular satellite, fortunately, was not destroyed, as happens sometimes, but it was knocked out for about three weeks. Um, look at the stars and stripes there. The DoD don't like to share too much in the way of the vulnerabilities of their systems. But when well, Four Star General did uh, speak out and say that uh, that the solar the space weather event did interfere with um, some of their satellites as well, and of course, as NASA is well aware, this is not something that's confined to here uh, technology here on Earth. But you can see it actually impacted the Venus spacecraft too. So lots of different things happening even with moderate level storms, and this is just one example. Take any outbreak of activity where we're seeing Ks of six, seven, whatever, and I'll share with you plenty of impacts. So um, again, staying with the, the cycle, I'd like to show this too because it's part of that message we have to get out to our government, our decision makers, our government officials, uh, industry, and users of space weather data. And, and this is I need to make a, a better plot for, for you guys. I can I can show this too, but I need to make a, a better plot for for the non-science background types. But essentially, what you're looking at here, of course, if starting at the top, working your way down, is what have I got here? One, two, three, four, five, six, eight cycles from back at solar cycle 17 to solar cycle 24, and we're looking at the occurrences of the K of eight. Now I show this. And Nancy and I were down in Atlanta with NERC a few months ago, and I said, show me where the solar maximum is based on K of 8s. Can't do it, can we? I mean, to take, for example, solar cycle 21. See it there in the middle? For the period of solar maximum, which was late 1979, for that whole year afterwards, there was not one occurrence of the K8. So if anyone, well, people had to be awfully let down if they were expecting a whole bunch of space weather around solar maximum from the geomagnetic storm perspective, there was nothing of any consequence. But several times in 81, 82, again in 83, 84, and so on. You get the point. You cannot suggest that things are going to be over once 2014 or 15 rolls around because we're past solar maximum. Yeah can happen any time over essentially an eight-year period. I'll concede that during the two or three-year solar minimum, things are rather quiet. It's also interesting to point out in this slide, makes me cry a little bit, solar cycle 24, abysmal, look, dated right up to 2000, I've got 9, 10, 11, 12, and nothing. We've got a couple of locations of K of 8. It's been extremely quiet, so if uh, you felt like this cycle was smaller than average, you're absolutely right. How are we doing before we transition here? Any questions? Nope. All right, good. So let's just jump into the um, the different the three different types of space weather and tie them into the different types of impacts and customers that we have here and talk a little bit about that. Um, Andy, did you ever? Did you guys cover the scales at all in class, or? Yeah, we we we've, we've gone through them a couple of times. Okay, so I'll use them to kind of to guide us here, and of course, as you know, the three scales being the the the, the flare phase of the eruption, the solar flare, radio blackout, and within minute, half an hour to several hours later, we get the energetic particles. That's our solar radiation storm, and of course, then the CME. Uh, a day to several days later, and the ensuing geomagnetic storm, and um, they use these scales are quite they're quite useful for for especially non-science types, so that they understand the types of impacts that can occur with the various types of space weather. Something that's difficult to get across to people, and of course, everyone likes you know could put some perspective on this. How often do these occur for a solar cycle? So let's talk about the first one, solar flares, and give you an idea of the customers we interact with when the flares occur. Uh, you've got an image here of the, the, the GOES solar x-ray imager, and uh, I'll just put it into motion. This was an interesting event that occurred in September 2005. Um, sometimes I like to, to use it as an example of how difficult our forecasting could be, because when I put this in motion, just look how quiet the sun was on this day in September.
for the seventh. Nothing, except for that bright area in the limb. And all of a sudden, huge X-17 flare right on the limb. I think our prediction for flares in that particular day, and of course this was pre-stereo, so all we had was really a, a brightness on the limb, and we might have been expecting a 5% chance of an M class or something. We got an X-17. That's what I call a blown forecast right there, folks. When we get a flare of that magnitude, we're essentially going to get a burst of electromagnetic radiation that typically spans the spectrum. So we'll get the radio waves, we'll get the X-rays, get those ultraviolet waves, and they're going to affect technology here on Earth in several different ways. Several customers for this information. I want you looking on the right hand side here. It's one of the first key customers is aviation. If you go to the aviation centers, you will see this plot up and running 24 hours a day. And what it shows is if you look at Central America, you'll see the little dark, little bright uh, yellow spot there is the subsolar point. And of course, the flare goes off, it's going to impact the ionosphere, it's going to impact the aircraft's communication. Uh, to communicate with the ground via the primary communication mode, which is HF, high frequency. High frequency is good because it's reliable and it's cheap. They like the airlines like to use it as the primary source of communication with aircraft in the remote areas. That is the Atlantic, the oceans, and the North Pole, the Arctic regions. When that flare kicks off, the atmosphere gets so disturbed. Watch this whole area. When it, when it, this is the, the essentially the eight, the high, the frequency spectrum here. Uh, we're looking at essentially three to thirty megahertz is the high frequency band. But when it goes red, we've lost HF communication capability. So the flare goes off, and all of a sudden, within minutes, we're looking at that. So aircraft controllers. At, oh, and in Long Island, San Francisco, talking on the aircraft over the Atlantic and the Pacific and the Caribbean, within a minute, the capability to communicate is gone. And they immediately have to go to various backup systems to try to communicate with that aircraft. This is the phenomena when I showed you earlier the quote from their, those, those folks that said severe operational impact. And this happens every time we get a flare of essentially. M5 or higher, we'll see close to complete wipeout of the HF communication capability on the sunlit side of the Earth, lasting from a couple of minutes to, in some cases, up to three hours. Other systems I wanted to mention that get impact and customers that are going to get this information include users of GPS. I'll show you that in a minute communications that not just HF but space based as well and radar systems. I'll share something with you that um, from a DOD perspective from my many many years in the DOD doing this but when I was in Palahua in Hawaii doing the radio observations when we had one of these big flares and a radio burst we had two minutes to get that information into Cheyenne Mountain to NORAD NORCOM and other critical DOD centers because these bursts from the sun were going to interfere with national security systems such as radar systems, over the horizon radar and whatnot. So it was very important information to get immediately to the DOD. Again, there's that. I wanted to give you a, a snapshot. There's a picture of the center. In, um, in New York, in Long Island, uh, controlling all the aircraft, communicating with all the aircraft over the Atlantic. And you'll see the picture right, right there on the left hand side of the, that, that ionospheric HF impact map that I just showed you. Do, Bill, do, do they have uh, uh, experts there that uh, understand space weather, or, or they're just kind of a uh, interesting whatever you give them and you know with ready you know cookbook how to react to that they have experts anti these guys this is not the FAA this is a group called Airwink and they have they have a they are a communications specialist group 
Um, they do a lot, a lot of different. Uh, they, they support a lot of different sectors with their communication needs. Uh, obviously, aviation is one of the biggies. Uh, they have lots of, uh, yeah, very um, technical uh, expert level uh, on all types of communication. So when we communicate with these folks, sometimes we'll talk to some of the folks on the floor who are very well aware of the impact. We wouldn't know the science as well, but there are others in that group that know it very well. Interesting to note as well that the um, I mentioned radar and I kind of focused on the national security radar systems initially, but it also impacts uh, our, our civilian radar systems. And this particular, again, I, I always like to use quotes just so that I'm not accused of a, a, you know, misquotes so, or you know, paraphrasing something incorrectly, but this is straight from the group, the guys up at NAV Canada. They said the flare resulted in significant impacts to the network of air traffic control radars in Canada. And you can read it there. False targets and interference from the north-south direction. So uh, yeah, impact, and they need to know immediately. A lot of the stuff too that we do is situational awareness because when people have impacts on critical systems, so such as traffic, air traffic control radars, they have checklists in front of them. And they must immediately address it. And if they address it going down the wrong road, then they're going to make things worse. So if they have notification that a flare is in progress that's causing this problem. They know what to do. They know they can wait it out. It's going to be fairly short-lived, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's a key piece of the operational um, response. It's just situational awareness so they do the right thing. Let me talk about the GPS part and our customers for that, too. I already mentioned a lot of it in the get-go with the guys up in Alaska and whatnot. Well, space weather, as you know, impacts the GPS systems in different ways. And this is one of the, the, the tricky ways here because it doesn't happen very often. It's nothing to do with the ionosphere, the ionosphere getting disturbed. This is the actual radio burst. Antti, did you guys cover this much? Yeah, we've talked about the impacts on the uh, positioning systems as well, yeah. And the, and the actual radio burst uh, on the 1.6 gigahertz? Yeah, we, we didn't discuss that uh, impact on the GPS, but we discussed the, the similar impact on the uh, cell, cell phones. Okay, good. So, um, so yeah, what you're seeing here is this is the International GNS System Network, network of receivers, GPS receivers across the world. This, again, is a daylight side effect. But as you know, a satellite is communicating with the ground at a given frequency. For the GPS, it's 1.2 or 1.6, the L2 or L1 frequencies, 1.2, 1.6 gigahertz. Of course, the sun is emitting at 1.2 and 1.6 gigahertz. As I sat out there in Hawaii some 20 years ago, I was monitoring 1.4 gigahertz for the Air Force, and the background level in solar flux units would typically be around 80 to 120 solar flux units. On this particular day, on 6 December 2006, that background level went from 100 solar flux units to almost 1 million. Consider our signal to noise ratio situation here now, where all of a sudden your signal is buried in the noise. And it did knock out the, the ability, the, the, the loss of lock uh, on several sunlit side GPS systems. I'll put this into motion and, and you'll see it happen. Even with some of the smaller bursts, will occasionally get some interference. But all of a sudden, bigger burst occurs, and red is bad, obviously. Loss, lose and lock with GPS. Now, a perspective here. Ten minutes, not a big deal. If you're driving on the highway, you're relying on your TomTom -tom to get to wherever, and, it, and you lose it for five to ten minutes, it's kind of what you do. You get over it. If you're landing an aircraft, <laughs> a half a mile visibility, with a low ceiling or a crosswind, and you're relying on GPS and all of a sudden it's gone, that's a big problem. So this was recognized by the FAA and others. So our big, big plan to introduce the next generation air transportation system, the next gen, which is our big improvement on the national airspace system to account for the incredible growth we expect over the next 20 years, it's going to rely on GPS for all phases of flight, in departure, in route, on arrival for landing. 
They know now they cannot obviously rely on GPS exclusively. Between the threat of cyber uh, impacts and the threat of space weather impacts and GPS systems, they uh, will have backup systems, those typical radar systems we use now at the key facilities. And you guys covered this a little bit. I just wanted to again tie it to a, to a customer. Um, so it interferes not just with the GPS satellite, but communication satellites. And our own GOAL satellites. On board the GOAL satellites is the SAR. That's the search and rescue satellite system. The search and rescue satellite aided tracking system. So when an aircraft or a ship is in distress, it's emitting frequencies at 406 megahertz. The, signal, the satellite is tracking these signals while they're tracking it as long as it's not interfered with through the solar burst. And that has happened on a number of occasions. Just showing one back here from the uh, SATOPS morning report from the SAP up there in Maryland, where they talked about the search and rescue receiver signal strength flagging red high. It was getting interfered with. And they contacted us and wanted to figure out if space weather was the, the, potential, um, the potential culprit and indeed it was. So we work very closely now with the, with all, I mentioned all the satellite companies, but of course these are just one of our own folks within GOES, within NOAA, the GOES and the search and rescue people to make sure they understand when that signal has been impacted. Any questions before I move on to the uh, radiation storms? Okay, so again, we'll go from the first scale to the second scale, talk a little bit about the solar radiation storms and how it, uh, imp how the different, different customers we have, they use this particular information. We know this stuff arrives 30 minutes to several hours later. Unlike the generally short-lived effects of the solar flare, the radiation storms can impact our customers for hours to days. And this is especially true when we have situations like October 2003, when we get eruption after eruption. So we see several injections of energetic particles into the near Earth environment, uh, prolonging the event and prolonging the impact on technology. Of course, we know this stuff is poor, is is high latitude focused as it feeds in along the the uh, pole, the North Pole and South Pole uh, magnetic field lines. Uh, so we've got a whole different customer base now we deal with. As you know, satellite operators very interested in how these particles might impact the uh, the spacecraft. Uh, manned spacecraft, uh, working with the folks down in Johnson, the astronauts, uh, and the exposure concerns. And aviation is one of the big ones I wanted to touch on. I won't focus here much because you've covered this. Satellite industry, various types of impacts can range from uh, a nuisance essentially to a worst case scenario where its spacecraft is rendered useless. Lots of things can happen with various, with various companies and agencies that will take actions. Some will do nothing at all, they'll just weather the storm. They, got a, they feel like they got enough protection or redundancy built in. Others will do various uh, maneuvering efforts to, to ensure the safety of the spacecraft. The airlines, folks, are one of our big customers, though. Back in 1999, you know, back in the early 90s, 80s, early 90s, we were in the Cold War situation, and we were not flying over Russian airspace. The best way to fly from the United States to Asia is right over the polar regions. You can see in the maps here the polar routes. We could not do that back then. Cold War ends in the early 90s. The economies in Asia start changing. The companies in the United States recognized that we had lots of uh, effort, lots of opportunities now to do business in, in Asia. And United Airlines were essentially the first. They flew 12 test flights over the North Pole in 1999. And they recognized what they figured, what they thought they'd recognize. And that was one that's shorter, point A to point B. They can make it without stopping. That was one of the key things, and especially with the introduction of the Airbus uh, 340s and the Boeing 777s, fly 16, 17 hours straight. 
So that's huge when you don't have to land somewhere and make two legs out of that flight. Another thing they discovered was that, well, weather is not an issue. Cold temperature and potential impacts on fuel a little bit, but you're not going to run into any big thunderstorm lines up in the North Pole, so they don't do any de reroutes due to, to the thunder convective or thunderstorm activity. And of course, the jet stream winds are, are it's good when you have a tail, but now when you have a good strong headwind, you don't have to worry about either case when you're over the polar regions. What they did find, though, is the biggest concern, and they've identified it as what? Space weather. For various reasons. When an aircraft is flying over the pole, it's going to rely, remember I mentioned earlier about remote areas and having to rely on high frequency communications? Same thing over the polar regions. When an aircraft flying over, over the continent, they use, three, they use very high frequency VHF, which is 30 to 300 megahertz for line of sight communication. They're always communicating with someone down on the ground. When you're out over the Atlantic, there's no one to talk to down below. Or over the North Pole, there's nobody to talk to. So again, they rely on HF communications. And during a big proton event, the particles are flowing in, interfering with the ionosphere, and the signal is getting degraded. And these folks cannot um, cannot communicate and cannot adhere to the Federal Aviation Regulations that require an aircraft to be able to communicate with the ground at all stages of flight. So every day before, there's about 20 flights per day now over the poles, and every day before they leave, they get a briefing of the weather conditions, and of course they get a briefing of the space weather conditions. And if we're at a nest three level, those flights reroute. They get on the phone to us, they try to get a sense for how long it's going to last. When, when we talk to the research community, one of the things we always point out is one of the great gaps in our forecasting ability right now are these proton events. Everything about them. When are they going to occur? How long are they going to last? The spectrum associated with the uh, proton event, how hard, how soft it might be, are all big question marks. So we have very limited skills in, in, in a lot of those areas. Um, just some empirical relationships have been established. We use a lot of that, but um, we've still got a long ways to go. But it's very important to these airlines. Sometimes if they have to reroute a flight that lands in Anchorage or Tokyo, it can cost that flight as much as $100,000. So picture what happens to your profit line with that particular flight when that happens. The airlines are one of the, the big, big customers where I spend hours on the phone with them during the big outbreaks that go on for a week or more. Another little touchy piece with the airlines is this one. It is the radiation exposure. The Federal Aviation Administration have a group in Oklahoma called the Civil Aviation Medical Institute, the CAMI. The CAMI will take our GOES measurements of the particle environment, do an assessment of the exposure environment, and on rare occasion, what happened I think, three times in the last 11 year cycle, in the last cycle, issue this particular product. And this one scares the heck out of me because I think it's going to lead to some confusion because I'm thinking a lot of, especially in this the day of our, our social media environment of, of today and the blogosphere and everything else, as soon as I get a whole bunch of people reading that satellite measurements indicate high levels of ionizing radiation coming from the sun, which may lead to excessive doses to air travelers, and then they look at this map and you see it almost extends over the entire United States. Uh, that's um, yeah. That could cause some concern. The uh, International Commission on Radiation Protection have established thresholds uh, of exposure, and these thresholds are very conservative, and they have been exceeded a couple of times during the um, very very big proton events. Maybe two or three times again per, per solar cycle. So that this product would get issued. So it's not going to get any, give anybody radiation sickness or anything like that. But it's just a, con a contribution of, of total uh, radiation dose, lifetime concerns, potential for cancer for 30 years down the road, this kind of stuff. So it's a, it's a touchy subject, but um, I like to, to advise, um, especially decision makers when I'm talking to them, that this, this can happen on occasion. If it does, it may cause uh, some concerns out there.
We have a question. Yeah. Did Noah or any of the airlines actually disclose the weather condition to the passengers during the storm when the when the flights are grounded? Do they do they do they notify the passengers? Yeah, did they actually Yeah, that is that yeah, if they, they it's, yeah. it's it's interesting. Go ahead, Andy. No, no, yeah, that exactly. So did, did, did the passengers know why you know the flights were rerouted or why there was a sort of change in the, uh, the the plan for the flight? That's a great question, and, and the answer is was slightly comical because I, I asked that very question a number of years ago to, to to some of my colleagues in the aviation community, and they said uh, I said so what do you what do you tell the passengers if you're rerouting a flight? Uh, due to a radiation storm, and he says, "You can be darn sure we don't tell them it's radiation, Bill." <laughs> so, I I can appreciate that. They um they they what they tell the passengers crew is it's weather. It's weather related. So they whether it's normal weather or it's space weather, it's the environmental conditions that are causing them to reroute the flight. They're never going to start talking about radiation. Fortunately. The impact on the high frequency communications, that's regulated. If you can't communicate with the aircraft, you have to reroute that flight. And that impact on communication happens a lot quicker with a, with a smaller radiation storm. You have to have a big radiation storm to ever get to that point of um, exposure concern. So most of the time, these folks are rerouting flights due to the loss of calm communication long before it ever gets to a point where it well, it could be an exposure issue, so it's kind of a fortunate, a fortunate side to the business here. Another interesting piece here, and you probably covered. Did you talk much about the launch vehicles, Santi? No, we didn't to talk too much about the, the launch operation. Yeah, so if anyone's familiar with a with a, the satellite launch is down at Kennedy or at Vandenberg, Kwajalein or wherever. Um, there's some of the big space, some of the big satellite, the launch vehicles we're using now, the Delta and Atlas launch vehicles, they have threshold, weather thresholds. They will not launch the, the spacecraft if there is, for example, a thunderstorm within five miles of the field, or if there is a 40 mile an hour wind. There's different thresholds established. But there's also thresholds established for space weather, and it's these protons. So they will be monitoring every single one of these launches. They are monitoring the proton levels prior to launch, and there is no, there is go, no go threshold established for the um, for protons. So fortunately, we've had very few. At, uh, the only incident I'm aware of was the one back in 2001, where, it, where there was an actual delay, and it was actually the first launch out of the Kodiak launch facility. And it was a, an, an Athena launch vehicle since retired, and um, that thing was delayed for I think it was the best part of a hundred hours before that uh, they were ready to launch when the proton event had come down. The thresholds for the different launch vehicles are different, and it depends on their orbit they're going to as well. But um, we work closely with the folks at Kennedy, and and down the road from us here in Colorado, we've got the uh, Lockheed, the the uh, United Alliance folks that work the, the radiation side, radiation vulnerability of these spacecraft. So we have them next door to us, and it's a, an important part of the uh, launch procedures that I wanted to share with you. And of course, this the EVA support. Maybe the folks down to, for the International Space Station. Um, a question. Yeah. John, go ahead. Oh, okay. sure. um, I you know, talking now about the customers, you know, you actually, you know, use the, 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 the time information and all that. But how, uh, how are these, you know, the, the customers really committed to um, the, re the importance of the research in this area? I mean, do they, do they just use the information or they, they actually try to get involved in that in order to improve the, the you know, the forecasting? Yeah, you know, I, I'm just now getting this volume adjusted on this, Auntie. Sorry, could, um, I missed a lot of that question. 
Yeah, well, I, I guess, you know, if I rephrase that, uh, you know, the, the customers and end users you have, uh, you know, the, that are using the space with the services, do they also acknowledge the, the importance on of the research done done on the topic? And, and yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. The, the, the one thing, one of my responsibilities is when I talk to these many different uh, sectors and industry types and with our, our leadership in Washington and whatnot, I must tell them the facts, what we can do and what we cannot do. I cannot go in there and say we, you know, we're, we're every big any big event, uh, Basti or a. Um, 1859 like a bent that we'll, we'll, we'll see it and we'll be able to warn you. I have to always explain the limitations on what we do. And the limitations on what we do are great. There are big, big gaps. So the focus quickly turns on to the, re turns to the research. The critical observational platforms, the modeling, and the basic research to somehow get us to where we need to be to be able to support the nation's needs for accurate timely space weather services so fortunately it goes down it goes in that direction very quickly very fast um, Andy would, would, will tell you that you know there's, there's there's many many millions millions of dollars put towards the space weather research uh, in recognition that there's still a lot of work to be done in that area and I highlight it all the time Does that answer the question? Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Sure. So I also want to point out the, um, of course, our astronauts, um, e an extra vehicle activity, a spacewalk. They have, there's all sorts of different thresholds at the International Space Station for anything from stowing the big billion dollar robotic arm to the astronauts actually taking shelter in hardened parts of the station, depending on the different types of uh, energetic particles and the the radiation levels that we're measuring on the on the the TPEX, the tissue equivalent proportional counters on the International Space Station, and whatnot, and the thresholds are different inside the space station and outside the space station, where the spacesuits provide obviously a different level of protection than inside the spacecraft. So we're always obviously providing support to to our astronauts in the space station to to ensure their safety. Interesting too, when the um, the International Space Station is very much international, and when the alerts and warnings go out, uh, they get it would be a single customer for us because we'd route it down to NASA, down to, to Johnson Space Center to the Space Radiation Analysis Group, and then it would in turn be redistributed across depending on the warning. So if you look, of course, the one of the biggest concerns is the energetic solar particle event, and everybody gets that. So you'll see. Various groups, European Space Agency, um, Lockheed Management, European Space Agency, Case Canadian Space Agency, Japanese, etc., all get the alerts and warnings so they're aware of the space weather conditions that could be impacting operations on the International Space Station. So that kind of captures the, the first two pieces of the customer base, the, the primary customers that we provide the alerts and warnings to. And, to some degree, how to use the information and whatnot. Um, so I'm going to transition on to that last piece, the geomagnetic storms. Is there any question at this point about that uh, about the radiation storms? No. Nope. All right. Let's talk about the last piece, geomagnetic storms, and what we see in our operations center and the customer base for um, for the geomagnetic storms. Obviously, what we're looking here looking at here is for that. Big CMEs, coronal mass ejections. I show that to people, and they always love that nice image there. But of course, that's not the one we're concerned about. We're much more concerned about the ones that are um, less dramatic, forming that halo, such as the one we see here, coming towards us. And of course, we use this information. You see the little green circle to 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 fit the cone, run the Enlil model. We um, have to figure out if it's zero directed, measure the velocity, angular width, axis of propagation, and whatnot. But we use that coronagraph as key for that purpose. We need that coronagraph. We plug the information into the model. 
the NLO model. It'll predict when the thing CME is going to arrive. Uh, give some indication of the, of the uh, magnitude of, of the, the speed and um, density at the arrival of Earth. But of course, the big, one of the big gaps in this is we don't. It doesn't give us a real good sense of just how strong it's going to be based on the Z component. Uh, we've had lots of incidents already this year with expectations of uh, bigger storms when the the BZ stayed northward or just didn't go very far southward, so it's the one missing link. But this NLO model has proven to be very valuable. One of the things, if I can tell you from my own perspective of sitting on the forecast desk during the last cycle, where sometimes this model is somewhat un underappreciated because I see a lot of focus on when the C on this helping us when the, know when the CME is going to arrive. And, when the geomagnetic storm is going to start, we're, we used to have a lot of difficulty in if the uh, if the point of origin of the eruption on the sun was say near the west limb, 60 degrees west or whatnot. You know, a lot of times you're you're flipping a coin whether that's going to hit you or not. So what this has done, and I've found to be very useful, very accurate, it tells me yes or no whether it's going to hit us. Those particular if, if it's if the eruption is center disk. And I've got a big full halo, like October the 28th, 2003. I don't need a model to tell me I'm going to get whacked by a CME in, in less than 30 hours on these perfect storm type scenarios. But a lot of these storms, when I see them over there near the limb, or the, the origin near the limb, you know, yeah, it was such a difficult thing. We'd expect it to come in and never would, or, we would, or vice versa. Uh, so it's proven to be very useful in, in that capacity. Of course, the, the 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 big piece then once it leaves the sun and we figure out when, if it's going to hit the Earth. We're watching Ace hits the Ace spacecraft. You can see the nice jump there and the impact on the Earth's magnetic field. And of course, we got the CME in progress. So our prediction be anywhere from 20 to 90 hours, and obviously we know these can last for a day or so. And of course, they do they do um, create problems, big problems sometimes in the ionosphere as well. So our customer base here at the Space Weather Prediction Center, wide ranging. Everybody gets geomagnetic storm watches, uh, warnings, uh, and alerts. Whether it's satellite operations or right down here on Earth, of course, the electric power grid, GPS, all interested. The, a lot of them, as I mentioned, using the geomagnetic storm as the proxy for the ionospheric disturbance. So let's talk about a few of these uh, different impacts. I don't. Did you show this uh, image, uh, Auntie? Uh, no, not that particular uh, image, but I mean, we've talked about the same phenomenon. Yeah. So this is the wide area augmentation system, and uh, it's used by the FAA. And when we see, watch this where it goes blue is just the vertical error limits. Blue is good, but once it goes into that red, we start losing it. You see, the entire country is essentially impacted, and you'll see it continues to run here. But for 15 and 11 hour periods, October 28th, 9.30, that system, you see it's trying to come back there over the Great Lakes, but it was impacted significantly. So serious impacts due to, to, due to our ionosphere during that the big, the big geomagnetic storm. So just to give you some idea, some of the customers, obviously the FAA are concerned. We just saw that with their wide area augmentation system. Well, one of the big customer growth areas we've seen in the last Oh, I suppose the last five to ten years, because uh, I remember dealing first back in 2003 with these folks, and that is the oil drilling community. So whether it be the Shell, Exxon, Slumbergy, British Petroleum, they're all now getting the space weather alerts and warnings because they're using GPS extensively in their operations, drilling operations and surveying especially in, over the ocean, but over land as well. And this is one of the companies that supports the, this, the drilling industry, Hugo Chance. And you can see there, it's, uh, they described it as crucial to their organization to receive information on solar activity. Um, they went on to say that um, if there's airborne survey data or the marine data, 
are impacted due to the, the ionos, they call it high sword activity, it's the ionospheric disturbances, that the impacts could be as much as a million dollars a day, and that they clarify that would be a, to a single company. So uh, there, again, they need to know the space weather, they need to know the geomagnetic storm conditions, etc., and they will postpone their activities, or they'll use backup systems, whatever the case may be, but again, it's critical for them to know when that GPS is not acting right, not performing right. Precision farming, I had mentioned earlier, John Deere. This is an, another example of an email we got back. This is this year, April of 2012. Guy says he works with John Deere dealer in North Dakota, and they encounter lots of problems with their GPS auto steer when the K in this is a high. And what this guy wanted to do was he, he told us that he has a big customer base up there and across the Dakotas, reaching over to Idaho, Montana. And they uh, he was dealing with hundreds, up to a thousand plus phone calls a day because of impacts on the GPS during that April, again, moderate level storm. So he wanted to get the right information so he could kind of shotgun out information so he doesn't have to deal with, as he said himself there, the headaches and the thousand plus phone calls uh, with his technicians around the, around uh, his area of concern. So, you know, it's, it's again very real, impacts the systems uh, even when there's moderate level storms. And of course that last piece then is the electric power grid. I'm sure Auntie's covered this in detail with you, so I don't have to go too much into it. I'll just talk a little bit more again from our perspective, customer perspective. We recognize that these, this in impact can be anything from a nuisance to a, to a grid collapse, with a widespread grid collapse being the major concern. I'd just like to share with our leadership in Washington, this is not theory. This has happened before, just not on that grand scale that some suggest could happen. We had the 89 outage, we had the outage, we had the problems back in, in 91 with the nuclear power plants at Three Mile, Hope Creek and Salem in New Jersey, other locations. You can see how they describe severe overheating, melted low voltage service connections, etc. And as recently as 2003, with the impact highlighted in this Department of Homeland Security report, about uh, impact in Sweden, and uh, we know of impacts in the ESCOM network in South Africa as well. We get these alerts and warnings out to these folks, to the power grid, and they all have different standard operating procedures to respond to the level of geomagnetic storming. This is just one example. The ISO is the independent system operator in New England, and this is their procedure to implement solar magnetic disturbance remedial action. And they'll have a whole series of, you can see one, discontinue maintenance work, restore out of service, high voltage transmission lines, avoid taking long lines out of service, and so on. And there'll be, some of them will be very site specific to given locations and vulnerabilities like the Chester, SVC, and Arlington capacitor banks, etc. So we'll work with all the, the, the various power transmission generation groups around the country. We have to do that because the, as you know, this phenomena, geomagnetic storm, and the geomagnetically induced current, is a very localized feature. It's not, it doesn't, what happens in New England it can be totally different than anything that's happening in Washington State. And of course, in the lower latitudes, the impacts are much, well, much less vulnerable. So there's all sorts of different procedures at different locations with different groups. So it's a, it's a constant, uh, a service that we have to provide working with these folks and of course we're working closely with ANTI and CCMC and the USGS on trying to improve our services here to, um, to be able to highlight where the phenomena is going to affect you locally regional products that's where we want to be also interesting to see that even though you'll see a lot of focus on the higher latitudes but power plants this, this is the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission report, status report back in Halloween of 2003, and recognize this is just a piece I pulled out of that, from several state, other places that took action. But I like to show this because you'll see the standards, the Salem folks, 
New Jersey, always get impacted by any level of magnetic storming. But all the way down to Arizona, the biggest nuclear power plants in this country, Palo Verde, uh, taken action in response to the geomagnetic storm. You see Arkansas, Louisiana. So this is a, a concern not just confined to the higher latitudes. People even at the lower latitudes in this country recognize some impacts could occur, so they take action. In your spacecraft class, I'm sure you talked about the ele energetic electrons. I like to just show this because we see this fairly regularly, the charging issue with energetic electrons, but I also like to point out that it's not one of our lowest scales. So there's lots of diff other different types of space weather outside of that, the solar flare blackouts, the solar protons, and the geomagnetic storms. We also issue alerts. Uh, not based on any scale, but on the energetic electrons measured on goals, and we see this quite regularly. Um, I'm, I'm showing you the plot there, of course, the energetic electrons peak um, as we approach the solar minimum. So as things start winding down on the sun, they start increasing in the near-Earth environment on the energetic electrons. So uh, it's, it's all, I always point that out to the satellite company, but we've interacted with many different groups on, on impacts of the energetic electrons. This was pretty recently and um, we had these folks over at the Space Weather Week workshop in Boulder earlier this year in April and they're the Paradigm Secure Communications. They're the, from the United Kingdom, the MOD, and they came in and talked specifically, gave a presentation, like maybe one of the slides about the switching and problems they have when the energetic electrons are high. You can see that they actually send out warnings of risk of service interruption to customers when these electrons are elevated. Is it, well, so, was, this, well, was this a geostationary uh, spacecraft or where, where was this located? Geostationary. Okay. They, they have 11 spacecraft, Auntie. Right. And they are, they, I was kind of surprised that they shared as much as they shared given their key. Uh, responsibility was uh, MOD. Obviously, this was clear though to share, but yeah. um, it's, it's, off, it's often somewhat difficult to get, uh, for obvious reasons, to yeah. get information on, on defense systems. But uh, it, was, it was very good information from a good source there. So um, that that's kind of the, the what I wanted to do here with this first piece is give you the overview of the different, I just want to give you a flavor of all the different customers of space weather. I know you've covered bits and pieces of this already, but um, I just always like to share what we see in our Space Weather Prediction Center here, highlighting some of the, the, the growth areas and specific examples of, of, of impacts. Um, I, do, um, I do like to, to finish this piece with a little bit uh, something lighter. And it's this that I had a bunch of the FEMA guys visiting last year, mm -hmm. Federal Emergency Management Agency, and I'm talking about the impacts on HF communications and potential impacts on satellite communications. And one guy says, "Well, I guess if we have a very big event, we'll have we'll be relying on pigeons for communications, like we did in the days of old." And of course, I had to tell, him, "No, in fact." Pigeons are one of our customer pigeon races. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> so it, 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 it's and it's a fact that that creates no end of amusement for me because this product subscription service we have. One of the great things about it is I can go in and see when I look over the seventy, eight, hundred, nine hundred, 900, whatever customers every month, and just take a glance at who's coming in. And a couple of months ago, I saw this. An agency called what was it? Uh, Serenity Doves. So of course that got my interest, and sometimes I'll reach out to the customer to make sure they're getting the services they need, if you will. So I, I, I call these people. And I said, so exactly how do you use the alerts and warnings? And she explained to me that they're one of the companies that release the doves at a wedding. That lovely, serene, romantic sight. And I said, oh, that's great. So you'll, when the doves are released and they'll hover overhead, you'll see them circling. They're not circling in honor of the bride and groom. 
they're trying to get a sense of the magnetic field and get their bearing and head home because like migratory animals with that magnetite they can do that but during geomagnetic storms even at that G1 the K56 level they start getting confused and I've understood with my interactions with these folks that at the K7 level sometimes they're not coming home very often they realize once we get up to K9 these guys are flying upside down into the sides of buildings and all sorts of chaos so but I did have to I asked the woman with the serenity dogs I said so let me get this right so it's two hours before the wedding you're there with your dogs and you get a geomagnetic storm warning from the space weather prediction center and you're going to tell the bride that you're not going to release the dogs because of a geomagnetic storm warning <laughs> I want to be there when you when you tell her that. <laughs> anyway, it's a question that comes off up often is the impact of um, of space weather on biological systems. This is a well recognized and other understood piece, the, the pigeon racing, etc. But there's a lot of people in various universities and especially in Eastern Europe trying to understand potential impacts on human beings with increased stroke rates and all sorts of things and others studying potential links to to, to um, the whale beaching and different things like that that migratory animals do that seem somewhat odd but I'm not convinced I've seen a whole lot in the way of um, solid links uh, outside this particular one here with, with, with the pigeons. So um, I'm gonna I'll just finish this section with that um, Obviously, the big focus is today, uh, the technology evolution. Everything we do today is reliant on, on satellite technology, whether it's SATCOMs or GPS. You got the Department of Homeland Security talking to me recently about even our transactions on, on the ATM machines are all time stamped with satellite links. All this stuff is, is, is technology vulnerable to space weather. And of course, as, as Auntie and I know so well with our interactions with the power grid, the interconnectivity and the interdependency of systems is what creates some of the vulnerability at the power grid. So all combined has led to a, a huge increase in the interest of space weather. And we see that on a daily basis here in, in Boulder. So um, Auntie, what I could do is just open it up for a few minutes and for some discussion at this point. If you want to take a five-minute break, and then we'll transition back into the next piece where I'll talk more about the um, operations and specific products. Okay, so let's let's take a five five-minute break and, and then then continue. Okay, we have a question here. Yeah. Given some storms have only a couple of minutes to issue the alert. Is the SWIFTSI um, staffed by a lot of um, operators, or is the alert system very much automated? Yeah, we've got two. We've got two people on duty, twenty-four hours. Everything is automated to a certain degree. The the the, the when we're in the next se session, we'll talk a little bit about alerts, warnings, watches. Warnings and watches are forecast products. The alert is the actual uh, condition occurring. Um, we do we keep the two people on duty when it, when the when the threshold is crossed, the, the system is set up to detect it and generate the message automatically. Um, we do have an option to include some notes on there, some comments, some remarks. Obviously, it's very difficult to capture the the, the, the scope. Of the of an impact on a simple text-based message, so many times. So we have to keep two people on the desk all the time because as soon as that, especially if it's a, a four-level storm, as soon as that goes out, it's shut. You saw, you know, I mentioned product subscription service having over thirty thousand subscribers, and, and so many more just pulling data from the web. But as soon as that goes out, there's 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 thousands of customers around the world, and then phones start ringing. The airlines at the dispatch centers are going to look for updates, and they'll see the alert and the warning, and they'll say, "Okay, gosh darn it, we haven't had one of these in two years. What am I going to do?" Especially the nature of our, of our business with solar minimum, and nothing happens for several years, and they forget it. But the alerts and warnings will get generated automatically, and they'll be edited as necessary and then issued immediately. It'll all happen within 
seconds and uh, but so much of the support then becomes the, the phone so we, we, we need we need uh, we need to have people there and we actually have a high high activity response team that I would be a part of for example when things get really hairy then several there's three or four of us that will come in and, and deal with these phone calls and handle the airlines and handle the media etc cetera, etc cetera. so a little bit of everything. It's it's automated, but we definitely have to have those people on the on the desk on the clock. All right. Thanks, Bill. Let's have a few more minutes. Stretch our legs a little bit. Okay. All right. You. You've been at, at the, the prediction center. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I haven't visited the prediction center for years. Have, have Bill, have you have you no know, the the layout of your your center has it changed at all in, over over the past say four or five years? A, a little bit, Andrew. We did do a, a bit of an overhaul. Um, if you can remember back at, at the forecast center at Lapstermere here, it was kind of that old uh, battleship gray cabinetry that we had. It was it was not old, but it was um, a kind of a bulky setup. We, we wanted to move away from. So just this, just a year ago, I suppose now, we um, we did an overhaul in the forecast center. So it's the same room, kind of similar setup, just much more functional and up to date. Oh okay. I think I might have that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's the can we get this is the first slide you can see. You seeing that slide there? I mean oh. that, that that's the old one, right? I, I remember I I I've seen that, right? Yeah, that's that's the old one. Okay. Yeah. Has any of your students been out here? Um, I don't think so. I mean, we have we have uh, one teacher in this group, Car Carolyn Ngu. and Carolyn, I think she she's attended the the space of the workshop and at the same time visited there. But uh, none of the other folks here have been have been Boulder. I'm hoping at least at least some of the other graduate students that we have here, you know, I'll be able to bring them to a space of the workshop and then maybe maybe you know get a tour of your prediction center as well. Yeah, let's let's um let's for sure do that and and we'll we'll talk we'll do that separately from the from the um, larger tours that we do kind of for the general audience. I'd like to take you and the students over just uh, separately. And oh, that that that'd be really cool. Yeah, we we've been here at, the, at Goddard. We we did a, a excursion to discover because you know it's still sitting here. So that that was kind of cool. Mm. Uh, yeah, I'd like to get up there and back sometime. Too bad. Have Have you seen the Have you seen Discover? I've not. Yeah, you last, guys get it. last time I was up at Goddard was I think maybe four years ago. I gave a presentation there. Wow, you gotta come stop by, man. The next time I have to go up to Fort Meade for a meeting with the uh, National Security Agency, I think in January. So that's pretty close, isn't it? Okay. Isn't Fort Meade somewhere near you there? Hmm. Is Fort Meade isn't that somewhere pretty close to you, or where's Fort Meade relative to Goddard? Fort Meade? Hmm. I have no idea. Okay. When was the last time you were in DC? But you come to DC almost every week, right, or month? Yeah, it used to be that, but something happened with the federal budget. <laughs> oh. So uh, I think my travel will be confined to uh, here to Colorado Springs if I'm lucky. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now there's a couple of, of uh, key meetings that we'll have to attend, and that one is that one is one. So we may be up there for that. The AMS, I don't know. The, the NERC meeting, is that going to be in January? 
I think it, it's going to be, a, you know, yeah, the January at some point. I haven't heard anything, you know, definitive, but uh, my understanding is that it's in January. Yeah, okay. But that's probably going to be in Atlanta, right? Yes, that's what I expect anyway. Yeah. So we, we, have a, we have a commitment to that. Any of these kind of meetings, you know, it's unfortunate, but the conferences, you know, are not considered priority versus getting the operations done. And, and the meetings with NERC are considered operational, so uh, we, we, yeah, we, we, pro, we can go to them. Oh, we got three, three or four people going to AGU, Rodney and Terry, and uh, Rodney and Howard, and, and uh, Rashid will be out there next week in San Francisco. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, well I, I guess, you know, at least Howard can, you know, argue that it's also ops-related because we have the... Uh, That's right. Valid model, model validation and transition thing going. That's right. We briefed that this morning. Yeah. So that's, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. Is that uh, stuff that I covered? This, I, you know, I was concerned that I was doing a little bit um, too much overlap. I don't know how much of that you covered this morning uh, in your earlier courses. Um, what I just covered there. No, I think I think it was perfect. Uh, you know, obviously, obviously, you know, you know physics-wise, there's some overlap, but I mean, I think it's really good to have you know another angle to the same topic, and actually, you know, see okay, see see the uh, the you know the width of your customer base and all that stuff. So it it was really good. Good, good. All right. So that's now, all. yeah, that's all. That's all stuff. When they, if anyone they would come out here, that. Um, I'd show them in greater detail. One of the difficulties we have here in the business, as you can well imagine, is there's there's um, there is uh, confidentiality requirements and people signing up for lots of time. So an awful lot of stuff that you, you can't put out uh, on, in, in public and whatnot. Uh, so it's it's easier to discuss some of that stuff here. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. So, uh, Bill, when, whenever you're ready, we're everybody's back here and you know eating cookies, so we're we're we're, we're good to go. Great, great. Okay, that that sounds great. Um, let's transition now into a little more of the. Um, I'm going to jump right into the um, the operations center here itself to talk a little bit about the the data and the products and services that we use here in the the space weather prediction center and. A little bit on the, the policy kind of side of the house, so I am going to start here with um, this picture. You see the picture up here? That's um, Auntie and I were just talking. The last time Auntie was here was uh, four or five years ago, and this was the old forecast center. It's the same room; hasn't changed an awful lot. We just got rid of all this kind of cabinet cabinetry, but essentially, kind of looks like this, where we have a uh, two forecasters, two workstations, one here, one here. And the center console, when when uh, we bring in the extra staff, a lot of the, the work in those two side rooms uh, with a lot of the same kind of material available, so we can manage media and other activities. So come visit us. This will be the the, the operations center. Um, the products product suite. I'm going to talk about. I don't want to go into tremendous detail on this. Obviously, is no, no real point in that. But uh, just to give you kind of the broad brush overview of. Um, Product services and data. Uh, the key thing from 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 our perspective, uh, more the, the priority, if you will, given our position in the National Weather Service, is this: alerts, warnings, watches. Uh, if I was to use three words as to why we exist, it's alerts, warnings, and watches. That's what we got to do so people can react, take the appropriate action to protect our critical assets, critical infrastructure. Uh, along the lines of the National Weather Service mandate, which is the protection of, of life and, and property. Um, we do differ, we got some legacy systems here. There's been a little bit of a, a, a little bit of a, I don't call it a conflict, but a little bit of difficulty working with our own National Weather Service because our definitions of large watches warnings are a little bit different. Uh, we brought these with us from uh, OAR, Office of Atmospheric Research, International Weather Service. However, it seems to be working fine. Um, what, so the, those three issues, those, those sort of, excuse me, those three products, the alerts, warnings, and watches, are, are simply this. In, in sequence, 
watches we issue for geomagnetic storms when we observe the coronal mass ejection, leaving the sun, run the angle model, and it's uh, the watch goes out. The watch is similar to a hurricane watch. When a hurricane is sitting offshore of Miami, for example, 48 hours offshore, we haven't pinpointed where it's going to make landfall, but we issue a watch that governs a, a range of, of shoreline, maybe 200 miles stretch, whatever, and uh, it gives everybody a heads up that something is, is likely to occur uh, in the coming day or two days. So we do that with the geomagnetic storm watches. Obviously, we don't do that with the flares. We do not know five minutes before that flare occurs that it is going to occur. Another one of the big gaps in our forecast capabilities. We can see a sunspot group. We can measure its complexity and size, and we can assess its potential to produce a flare, and consequently we issue a probability forecast. But five minutes before it happens, yeah, I don't know what's going to happen. And then we, um, so when it does happen, we issue the alert. But let me stick with the, with the sequence here. There's the watch strictly for the geomagnetic storms. Warnings, yeah, so as soon as that chronal mass ejection hits the spacecraft, we, or the A spacecraft, we can issue a warning. Warning is an imminent condition, defined as the imminent condition. If it hits that spacecraft, it is going to hit Earth. It doesn't miss. The thing is too big, right? So there's a, it's a high confidence product. And the alert then is the activity itself. So we're, we give, we're using the power grid as an example. We give them a heads up. Something just happened. It'll be here in two days. Hits the A spacecraft. We give them the warning. And then hits the Earth's magnetic field. We alert them. We do issue warnings for geomagnetic storms and for protons, the radiation storms, proton events. Not a great skill on the on the proton warnings, but you know there's certain things we certainly do know. For example, if you get a very large flare, remember the one I showed earlier in the presentation that was on the east limb on the left hand side, and I said it was an X17 flare? Well consider obviously where it was located, right on the limb versus right on the center disk. It's going to make all the difference whether we're issuing a warning and if we do issue a warning for when the protons are going to occur. Because obviously if the sunspot group is right in the middle of the sun, we're very well connected, and those energetic particles are going to be flowing in in 30 minutes. So we're not given much lead time. We picture a customer out there like the, like, the, um, like the airline dispatcher. He's getting ready to launch his flight from Chicago to Beijing in about four hours. And he hears, he gets an alert that says he just had a, a um, R4, an X12 flare. Huge, right? Now he wants to know, is there going to be protons? Because I'm going to make my decision based on the protons. Well, he doesn't know that. He's not going to be looking at the sun to see where it occurred. He's waiting for our prediction. So if that thing occurred right there on the east limb, we know the typical response particle environment that we will see in the, in the near Earth when the sunspot, when the eruption is on the east limb versus the center disk. So we try to educate them to, to watch closely after the flare what the, four, what the proton warning might look like, or if it's one that's coming, first of all, and then when is it, when will we predict the onset of those protons. If it comes from the east limb, like that X-17 flare, it's going to take hours to get here. We're not going to see an immediate response uh, of enhanced particles. We, we know this. It takes several hours. And uh, alerts, of course, are issued for every condition. Flare condition, the, the radiation storm thresholds as they're crossed, and the geomagnetic storm conditions as they're crossed. So they're the kind of the three key, we call them the event-driven products. Alerts, warning, watches. So that's kind of like our tornado warning or our hurricane watch, whatever you want to liken it to. That's what, what they are. At the same time, of course, as you know, we've got all these other types of things that people have to defer to because this is the difficulty in our business. If I tell somebody a big flare just occurred and they know, okay, flares do impact high frequency communications, but sometimes they forget it's the daylight side. So you have to defer to the product, this the D region absorption plot, this one right here, to see and you can obviously figure it out without looking at it, but you want to see exactly where's the subsolar point, where's the impact going to be, 
So if I'm dispatching an aircraft in this situation out to Hawaii, I'm going to advise them to use SATCOM because I'm not going to be able to communicate via HF in the next hour or so due to this flare, whatever the case may be. So we have to educate our customers to take this heads up. This is the, the, the text products is the heads up and then we need to get them to go to various products it's a long process, folks, to educate these folks to do this, but they need to look at these products to find out where, like when I mentioned the geomagnetic storm warning or alert is used as a proxy for the ionosphere, come to the total electron content map or any other ionospheric product to find out where you might be affected or whatnot. And the work that Anti's doing and the USGS were working together to support the electric power grid, same thing, because when we issue warning for geomagnetic storm right now it is based on a planetary value so I've got seven magnetometers one in France one in England several in Canada a few in the United States and together they make up the planetary value the planetary K value and that's what I'm issuing an alert time but what does that mean if I say there's going to be a K7 storm in one hour what does that mean to the folks in Maine the folks work in the Chester power plant, the folks work in the Tree Mile plant, versus the folks in Oklahoma or in South Carolina. See, it's they, they, they have to be able to turn quickly to a product, perhaps a graphical product, or even a text-based product that specifically identifies what they might experience at their location. That's what they want, that's what we're working towards. And Nancy says we'll be there in about six months, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> No, it, it's a, it's a, we, we have some near-term goals, but it's, it's going to be a, it's going to be a while to get to where we really want to be. But there's great work on the way. So yeah, so to, just before I move on, so just in summary, uh, significant uh, event-driven products will give everyone the heads up. Things are happening. They have thresholds. They have, they have responses based on those thresholds. Sometimes we'll turn, they'll turn to the various graphic products to understand what's happening and uh, take the, the appropriate action. Now, I'm, I, I like to show this when I'm on the subject of alerts, warnings, and watches. Because, unfortunately, unfortunately, sometimes people say most of things bad publicity, right? Well, when the, the stories come out, think about the folks out there with no science background, no understanding of space weather, never heard of a solar flare, and then they pick up the Washington Post, and they pick up the uh, ABC News, and it says biggest sunstorm in years passes Earth, or biggest solar flare in years headed for Earth, as was the case with the CB, CBS Los Angeles. Now, what do you think people are thinking when they see the biggest solar flare in years is headed for Earth? Um, do I need to get into the basement? And, and, and get my, my aluminum foil hat on or something to protect myself. And people just don't have a perspective of, um, of, 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 of what this means when they read these headlines. So it's a big, big challenge to try to communicate to the general public, but I also have to communicate with the customer base that I'm after covering in the past hour because it'll happen every time whether it's someone in the power grid or it'll be the United Airlines and they'll pick up the phone and they'll say, Bill, I just heard the biggest flare in years was headed for Earth and you haven't called me. And I said, please, please adhere to the official alerts and warnings. Now, we all work closely together in government to, 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 to put out an official uh, observation and forecast and just use that versus the headlines on the newspapers. So I, I just like to highlight this because, um, again, when I give you a snapshot of what happens in this operation center, this is a big piece. It's trying to deal with the public and the confusion that occurs when the media run with these stories and come out with all these dramatic headlines and people have no idea what's going on. I had one sto one situation there with the event earlier this year. One of the when was that, Dante? I think we had a proton event with the April activity. And I get a call from a guy, and he says he wanted me to talk to his wife because they were flying from Los Angeles to London, and there was a proton event in progress, and they had this plan, the vacation planned for the best part of the year, and they were leaving the next day, and she was not going to go. 
because she read there was a proton, a radiation storm that increased radiation at aviation altitudes, and their vacation was coming to a screeching halt because of that proton event. And uh, I think it was the most important thing I did this year. Was I told that guy? I said, put her on to me, and I says, look, this is like you get more radiation from the radon in your basement. I said, so don't worry about it. And she. Um, she blessed me left, right, and center, and uh, off they went to London the next day, I think. so. But yeah, you know, it's just an example of you know, the, the difficulty we have with this, this, this whole business of space weather and, and, and some of the challenges we face here in, in the operations. So, so, I mean, Bill, over the years, when, when you, you've been doing the edu education for your customers, have you seen that, you know, there's, you actually, are able to make progress and, and that you know that they have lifetime of that uh, customer knowledge is longer than 11 years or do you have to re-educate them every 11 years? I would say unfortunately it's most more the latter um, especially in this I mean our worst case scenario is unfolding here where we have a um, we just had a solar minimum it went on for you know the last big event as you know I think it was December 2006 so of any real consequence so we've got a, we had a prolonged solar minimum and now we've got a solar maximum with when things are when it's looking to be pretty darn low with not much happening and if we do get that big event here you know it's people are gonna are, it's just out of sight out of mind simple as that it's human nature you know, four or five years pass people work in airline dispatches yeah, they just kind of, it's re-educate, re-educate, re-educate all the time. There's never a point where that's where we're going to be able to sit back and say, ah, we're done. Yeah, yeah it's, 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 it's a constant chore. So the, uh, uh, there's a couple of things on the, the data streams that's important, uh, and this is a, a nice way to kind of illustrate the important relationship between uh, NASA and NOAA. The, um, the, for, from an operational standpoint, the forecast center, when we talk about those, those three key things that I mentioned, alerts, watches, and warnings being the, our bread and butter, in order to provide alerts, watches, and warnings to the nation and have the appropriate response procedures established across the nation, we, we rely on a suite of data we refer to as operational data because it has essentially three things. It is real time, it is continuous, and there's redundancy set in. That way we ensure 24-hour service. So the three things we talked about, the three NOAA space weather scales, are based largely on the, the real-time continuous uh, data with redundancy set in. Two of them, the radiation, the radiation proton event stuff, and the solar flare radio blackouts are the measurements on goals, and we always have two or three GOES spacecraft in orbit. And the third piece, the geomagnetic storm, is from the magnetometers operated largely by the USGS uh, with several magnetometers in place and now provided in real time with appropriate backup procedures. But of course, what happens is, for example, with the NASA data streams, when you look at SOHO and ACE in particular, they're the ones near and dearer to my heart because they were essentially launched just as I got here the boulder in 1996. Soho with its with the coronagraph and ACE with the solar wind. The we had a good sense that this information was going to be valuable to operations. Fortunately, with the with the ACE data, we worked with NASA, put a beacon on there, and we get the information down in real time. And it turns as turned out to be incredibly valuable. The coronagraph, I would say, is equally valuable. It's on the Soho spacecraft. It's old. We, get some, we do have chronograph imagery on the stereo spacecraft, but there's obviously issues with stereo as it moves behind the sun, and it too is already getting old. So the process is, is it supposed to work, and it is kind of working in that way, is that we recognize the tremendous value of this information. We incorporate it into our operational procedures, and then we push hard to get these implemented as part of the operational suite so they go back to that the other previous page so that we always have real-time continuous and hopefully with redundancy hard to picture that in today's uh, budget environment for for an L1 mission but this that's kind of the way the two different data sets work we, we absolutely use this information 
from the NASA spacecraft in our operations. But Auntie knows, I know, and the rest of the community knows, if this thing dies tomorrow, we got a big gap. Running the Enlil model, seeing those chrono mass ejections and understand how they're evolving, we got big problems and we're emphasizing that so we can get follow-on activities. The Discover spacecraft scheduled to launch in 2014 will satisfy much of the L1 requirements, but we're still working on the coronagraph. So kind of stay tuned with that one. And to talk a little bit about the models um, and other products here in the, in the forecast center, just to highlight a couple of things uh, I wanted to I wanted to, to, to focus in on today. The, uh, the WSA Enlil, I may, I've already talked about this and shown the run. It's been very important to our operations. We're very pleased with it. We uh, expect only improvements here. We have to work a little bit on the, the WSA side. The, the, that's the Wang Shu Yarji to kind of establish better those, those inner boundary conditions to make sure this model propagates that CMA out the way it's really coming out. And so lots of room for improvement, which is great excitement, but essentially, folks, we went from a place when I was a forecaster down in the forecast center 10 years ago where we were plus, plus or minus 15 or 18 hours, something like that, on the arrival time. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, missing a lot and, and, and whatnot to a situation where we're basically plus or minus six hours and seeing a lot of value in this model. So a lot of, a lot of, um, a lot of happy people here with, with the, how, that, how this model has evolved. And, and a good, great example of our interactions uh, with NSF, NASA, and NOAA to get this into our operations here. Uh, we just introduced the Ovation model here, which is, is, is exciting too, because you know, we have a important function here to support national critical infrastructure and whatnot. But well, we've got a lot of people out there just interested in the northern lights and seeing the aurora and whatnot. And it was funny, when I looked back a couple of years ago, I should do it again, at that pose plot of the aurora oval, we had like 250,000 unique hits over a one-week period, all trying to, you know, so, so some people, many people have it on their bucket list. They'd love to see the northern lights. Northern lights and northern lights. Um, so that's um, is another interesting um, recent development. And in, the, in our space weather prediction test bed, Rodney Farrick, our head of our test bed here, is, um, is it, the test bed is essentially that piece here at, at the Space Weather Prediction Center where we interact with, with ANTI and CCMC and, and others on the, on the transition of the models into operations. And the key thing today is, is ANTI has got the, the, the lead, or certainly one of the leads, is, the, is this geospace model. We've got the NLIL model. There it is. It's going to tell us what's happening on the sun, how it's propagating towards Earth, but what happens when it gets to Earth? What happens our magnetic field, our ionosphere, the electric currents that develop, where are they developing? That's what we want to get next, and this geospace model is going to be a step in that direction. You actually, Howard gave a presentation this morning, Auntie, I don't know if he told you he was doing that, and um, it was an exciting update on, on what's happening there, and the, I, I think you've, this class there probably knows that you're in the middle of uh, uh, evaluating several of these geospace models to assess their their value and potential use in operations. So, lots of exciting stuff happening there. Yeah. And the whole atmosphere model is um, is let's go the next step. Let's couple the ionosphere. The ion, let's let's take the weather models, the GFS, the the UK, the European models that are so mature as well as relative to many of our models and, and raise the ceiling to get an understanding of the physics, the interactions uh, uh, not from below but above as well and, and raise the ceiling right up to 600 kilometers. So we've got activities well underway here and indeed they're happening in Europe with the European model to do just that. So it will be described as the whole atmosphere model. And um, Operational products with the critical new data sets, geomagnetic storm products, essentially are upgrades to the uh, magnetic storm products. One of the problems we we're having is we've got A's, we've got K's, we've got DST's, we've got DVDT's, 
and people are saying, for the love of God, help us out here with what scale. So we try, we're trying to get it down to having uh, uh, one or two simple uh, scales, whether it's that K and, and G, whatever, uh, without confusing people. We work closely with the USGS um, to get the real-time magnetometers. USGS were not funded to do anything in real time several years ago, but with the interest level in the last four, when did they go real time, Andy? It was just the last two or three years, isn't it? Yep. Sure. Yeah, so it's just, again, recognition of the, the importance of this information. Uh, they stepped right up and funded to, to take, take the appropriate action to get that stuff in real time out to the, uh, to the nation. And, um, and we're reaching out now to international partners. Um, and when I say we, it's at the space weather community, the NASA, NOAA, and, and all working with uh, many different uh, international partners now. And, and specifically, I call out the magnetometer data here because we worked with the UK to get one of their magnetometers in real time uh, to populate the, the, uh, the planetary value, the planetary measure we make to get the planetary value and have worked with the French to do the same thing. And the Koreans are um, working with us now. I think we're almost there. In the next uh, coming weeks, there will be a station from Korea that will be in, from the island of Jeju in the southern tip of the Korean peninsula. We'll be producing real-time uh, magnetometer information uh, for inclusion in the, in the calculation of the planetary value. I wanted to highlight this component of our national interest in space weather because it has become um, quite significant, and that is, is the Department of Homeland Security and the Federal Emergency Management Agency. Period. Um, they have they have a critical response, and they work very closely within the DoD side. They're kind of this, the DoD civil support side is NORTCOM and NORAD. Down in Colorado Springs, uh, so we work very closely with these folks. But they're very big players in this business because they're very interested in potential impacts on the critical infrastructure. So they're especially interested in the potential big event. Now, this guy, if you look at this picture right up here, where you see me talking, this is Craig Fugate, and he is the administrator, the guy, the director of FEMA. So uh, you might have saw him a lot on TV during the um, Hurricane Sandy. Um, but it, it, it's at that level, um, and it's just interesting to point out kind of a, a cute story. I was um, back in Ireland, it was a year ago, and I was sitting with a couple of my friends in a pub in County Wicklow, and I get this text message or this email, and it was from the White House, and they were interested in understanding uh, something that was just read about the threat of space weather. And they quickly turned it over to these guys, FEMA, who talk, got in contact with us, and uh, we, they, we, they wanted us to communicate with them in the White House within, by the end of the week to discuss this very issue, because they're trying to understand how real this threat is, because this is, this is now you know, in that category of, of, of um, clear and, and present uh, threat and danger. You know, are we vulnerable to this phenomenon today? Could this happen next week? We as a nation, these leaders, must know that. So they're very much engaged uh, with us, uh, with the White House and with NASA. We're all part of a White House working group, in fact, uh, to, to address the many things. Auntie's doing important work trying to understand, for example, how frequent this event could happen, an 1859 event. Is it a 100-year storm? Is it a 500-year storm? Very important information when these folks are doing their risk assessment. So I just I thought it was important to point out to everybody that it's kind of at that level that, uh, that uh, our government leadership and the emergency response community especially are doing, um, are doing uh, lots of things in, in response to this particular threat. And um, just to sh highlight, same thing, the strategic national risk assessment that was developed last year talks about the this is executed in support of the PBD, the PBD-8 Presidential Policy Directive. It calls for the creation of a national preparedness goal, and it, this, this chart that I pulled out of the National Risk Assessment identifies 
there's the, there's not, it's not these are the this is the category of natural phenomena that pose the greatest threat to the to our homeland security, and you're familiar with all of them. And now you see space weather right in there. Notice first tornadoes. It's not in there. It's not in there because it doesn't pose a threat to the national homeland security. It causes a problem and a threat locally, but these phenomena are considered a threat to our homeland security, to the nation. So just um, recognize that again how it's been, how this issue of space weather has been elevated. And it's just, a, just, a, uh, just to finish up on this theme, the states at the state level, that's what I just focused on at the federal level, the federal government, whether it's White House and it's Congress or it's the FEMA's and NASA's and NOAA's of the world addressing space weather, but at the state level they're addressing space weather. And this is several, just a list of examples. Florida conducted a, a, statewide, a, a statewide emergency exercise based on a geomagnetic storm. New Jersey uh, did work with the entire state of New Jersey emergency response activity, a half-day session on space weather. Um, other than Virginia did it, and Mon I briefed Montana recently, and um, yesterday I was on the phone with Connecticut and provided them information. So even at the state level, lots of information that we're um, sharing with them, lots of concern for space weather. So just to um, jump into a, a couple of uh, key pieces on, on, on our website, um, I, and I talked a little bit about this, but some of you will be familiar with the, with the front page's web page, and I wanted to show, just to point out a couple of things. One is that we are doing a complete overhaul here. Um, we've got uh, a fair amount of criticism from uh, various sources and indeed our own leadership. This this model that you see here of, of, a, of a front page was fine 10 years ago. It is not anymore. People uh, do not want to see, uh, general public and whatnot, don't want to see big ugly plots that look like like, like the school's x-ray plot that really doesn't mean anything to them. We get some useful information here, but we're going to do an overhaul of the, uh, of, of the plot, of the, excuse me, the space weather page. So I kind of covered the, the event-driven projects, the watch warnings and alerts uh, already, and the summary message is when we issue watches, warnings, and alerts, the, the one thing we have to do is, is end them. When is the when is the condition over? So when a, when we do get we issue a, an alert for a radiation storm for a proton event, it could be going on for three days. When it finally ends, we issue a summary. So it's part of the event-driven product suite, but it's just the message to indicate uh, the end. And we were issuing an advisory bulletin, and a lot of people um, were getting this, but we changed this. Recently, I just wanted to point out that it is now gone, and we do a top news of the day on our website, which is perfectly adequate. We have found from our customer base instead of the advisory bulletin. So, just um, just wanted to show uh, what the watch looks like when we do have the uh, when we do run the Endel model. We figure out when it's going to come out. We, well, when we figure out when the geomagnetic storm is going to begin after it hits the A spacecraft, we, uh, we issue a watch. So it will say A index of 50 or greater, and down below it says periods reaching the G3, which is the K7 likely. So that's just a, an example of the message that goes out uh, for, for the heads up on a geomagnetic storm or watch. The warning hits the A spacecraft, we issue this. G magnetic K index of seven or greater, G three or greater on the uh, NOAA space weather scale. The watch and the warning are both forecast products. This is the near term forecast as I mentioned. Then when it hits the Earth's magnetic field and we see the big deviations in the magnetic field, we issue the alert. That condition that tells people that the storm is now in progress what's happening to your equipment right now for your situation awareness may be this a geomagnetic storm or a flare or the proton event hey bill how, how do you how do you guys uh, estimate the k index from from the ace observations 
I guess you have a you have an empirical model for that. Which one? Which one you guys are using? Um, well, yeah, we've got we've got two things we do. We've got the um, rules of thumb, where where we have various conditions when we see speed. We we bin them obviously. If I have speeds of of say four hundred to six hundred six hundred to eight hundred, or I have BZ minus five or minus ten for one hour or two hours. And what the what the typical corresponding geomagnetic response in K might be. So we have those, and we have the the um, what's the model called that we we use the um, wing KP. So we're running that model, which is essentially doing the same thing, right? It's just taking the solar wind dynamic pressure and is and and predicting the typical. Geomagnetic response given those solar wind conditions. Okay. So, just to give you an idea of the notification, then, when we do, I mentioned the product subscription service, and that product subscription service has been very good, very valuable. You go in, you sign up, I'll talk a little bit more detail here in just a minute about it. But you sign up for the alerts and warnings, and you get your alert warning. But there are certain customers that are high priority that we we work with a little bit differently, and I'll just want to highlight a couple of them. Here is one: the Federal Emergency Management Agency, Department of Homeland Security, and consequently uh, White House um, get the alerts through a different process here, and that is simply phone call. We cannot. There are certain customers where we cannot rely on a, an email uh, getting to them and if we don't hear back we, we, we can't be assuming they got it because the actions they take are too important. So uh, for this situation for example with, with the Federal Emergency Management Agency there's, there's two primary concerns with an emergency response community. One is that space weather could cause a major disaster and we all know what that is, a widespread blackout of the power grid essentially. If we have an 1859 storm, what is the consequence on the critical infrastructure? Uh, the grid is a big concern, but of course how it impacts GPS and satellites and whatnot is an issue. So that's the first part. But the second part too, they need to know, if they're in a response mode for a hurricane, for a Sandy situation, for a Katrina situation in New Orleans, and they're relying on commun backup communication systems, various communication systems, because of the disruption to the critical infrastructure in, the pro in that localized area. And all of a sudden, I've got space weather events that are impacting their ability to communicate. These field folks need to know that. They need to know the right steps to take, uh, given the space weather conditions and how it might be affecting their uh, response equipment, especially communication equipment and GPS. So they've, the, the, that's kind of the two primary concerns. So we've established a procedure where the four S4 and, and G4 and S5, G5, radiation storm or geomagnetic storms are phone calls to the FOC is the FEMA Operations Center. FAOC is the FEMA Alternate Operations Center in, in Atlanta, Washington, Atlanta. We pick up the phone, we issue the alert immediately and we get acknowledgement that they've received the alert and then there's procedures taken on their behalf to either notify leadership and to send issue alerts and watches uh, across uh, the emergency response community across the nation so people understand that you know potential impacts to the uh, critical systems so um, these, this is the process that's set up that's just a little bit different obviously than the product subscription service but those lower level storms, R2, S3, and G3, will be sent to the FEMA Operations Center for situational awareness via the email product subscription service. And for the power grid, a little bit different too. These guys have to get these alerts and warnings and take, to, take the appropriate procedures to protect the grid so we do not find ourselves in a vulnerable condition or something significant ha can happen and cause a cascading impact in a widespread area. August 2003 is often used as an example. It wasn't related. The August 2003 was not associated with space weather, but the interconnectivity of the grid 
where something where trees were falling on tree on power lines in Ohio eventually led to the blackout of New York City and parts of Canada is a good example of how we're so tied together, interconnected, and the same that the same vulnerability exists. Whatever might trigger it, whether it's the, the trees falling on the power lines or or, or, or a geomagnetic storm, uh, and the concern is obviously we can take a large chunk of the country out power-wise, and we just don't want that to happen. So we will issue the G2 condition or higher from Boulder up to four key centers, to the Western Electric um, Coordinating Center in Loveland and Vancouver, the Midwest Independent System Operator in St. Paul, and the New York Independent System, System Operator. They, in turn, depending, they have different procedures in place, but these guys will redistribute alerts and warnings then across the nation, across the continent, Canada and even parts of Mexico are in this, in this loop, and power generation and transmission groups across the country by the hundreds or even thousands will now get the alerts and warnings and then go to their standard operating procedures and start taking the appropriate, appropriate actions to secure the grid, protect the grid, protect the stability of the grid. As I mentioned earlier, the actions that will be taken in New Jersey and, and Maine and Connecticut, Pennsylvania will be different than the folks in Florida, Arizona, and whatnot. They all have their different standard operating procedures. But the key here is we make the, these are different, these are high level customers that require a phone call uh, as well as um, text based products. The, um, just a quick glance at the product subscription service and, and on our website you got email products it's also linked on the front of the page now the uh, to get to the alerts and warnings people can go in they sign up they, put, they, they manage your own account to receive the alerts and warnings you, you, you'll see here they can actually click on and get the K4 fives in this case I've got someone getting the K7 8 and 9 alerts um, and whatever they want to get the watches, etc. And they manage their own account. And this is how many, many of our customers uh, get the get the information they need. And then they, they can look at their summary. This individual here gets uh, tw has 20 subscriptions, and eight of them are based on geomagnetic storms, two are advisories, etc. So that's just kind of a page by page look at uh, the product subscription uh, service. And then, of course, as I mentioned, when they get those text-based products, we're, we want to get to a point where they can quickly go in and look at the appropriate graphic product to help further define their, the, the, their level of interest and their area of interest. Just a couple of things to finish up with. I kind of wanted to keep this to about two hours, and I'm right at that point right now. A little over. OK, so I'm missing them. I'm lost on time here, sorry. So just to finish up on the um, increased global interaction, lots of things happening. A lot of people ask me, what's the rest of the world doing about this? And I don't know if Auntie's covered it much, but just a quick chart here, or a quick plot here to, to highlight some of the big things. And um, we've got, uh, it's our space weather workshop last year. We had 18 different nations represented. There's many things happening in the United Nations on the WMO. The International Civil Aviation Organization, other groups like the commercial, or excuse me, the um, peaceful uses of outer space, and many different things happening uh, at the bilateral agreements with one on ones with different countries, whether it's the UK, Korea, and uh, various agencies within those particular countries. So lots of attention. That, by the way, down in the lower right is the beautiful new Space Weather Center in Jeju Island in Korea. Fantastic new building. So I'm going to finish up with that. There's just our contact information. You're always welcome to visit us if you ever are in the Boulder area. I'm hoping Andy can bring some of you guys out for the uh, Space Weather Workshop in April of 2013, and we'll certainly have a special tour for you all in the Forecast Center to talk more detail here. So I hope that uh, helps give you an understanding of what goes on in the Space Weather Prediction Center. And um, stay in touch. Thanks so much. Thanks, Phil. Do we have questions? 
The question is that is there a fee for your sub, uh, subscription for your services? No, that, that's a question that's asked often, and there is not. It's, uh, there is, I suppose I could say there is a fee at your taxpayers, right? Tax, taxpayers' dollars. Um, it's part of the National Weather Service. National Weather Service has a responsibility to provide products and services in protection of life and property, and we are part of that organization. Um, commercial sector groups, and there are, you know, in, in regular weather, you've got the AccuWeather, you've got the Weather Channel, WSI, and all these different groups, and they provide specific tailored support for various sectors and industries and companies. In space weather, we're seeing some of the same stuff. There's a growing uh, commercial space weather uh, family now that of various companies that will take our information. Uh, we try to specify the space weather environment and predict the space weather environment. We're not going to get to a point where, we, where we're, we're going to provide tailored support for Delta 596 from Atlanta to Beijing, for example. That's where the commercial sector comes in. We're not going to provide tailored support for British petroleum who are, dealing, who are drilling in the ocean and want more tailored specific information on how their system might be impacted. The, the company, some private vendor will do that. They'll take our general information that the government provides, the measurements of the magnetic field and the, and the measurements of the radiation environment, and then they take that information, tailor it into a product specifically for the British Petroleum or Shell or United Airlines, et cetera, et cetera. But our services, the, the basic service is free. All right. So, Bill, Bill, let me ask you this. Uh, you know, over the semester, we've, we've been in, in this class, we've been talking a lot about, obviously, you know, space weather modeling and space weather forecasting. And uh, you often hear, you know, being said that uh, space weather forecasting is, you know, decades, maybe, you know, 30 or 40 years behind the, the, the forecasting community in, in the regular weather. Uh, arena. I mean, what's what's your take on that? Are we are we decade decades behind? I say absolutely, absolutely not, and absolutely yes. <laughs> Depending on which one we're talking about, I I always like to highlight to people that, uh, and you know this, Auntie, the on the very big, the perfect storm scenarios, we're in great shape really because when that's I don't want to say in great shape, but we're in good shape. When the big, big flare occurs in the center of the disk, and, and I always use October the 28th as, as the example. Uh, I was on the desk that day, and there's a, there was an X, the X, whatever it was, 17, and an X-17 one day, and the next day it was the X-10 flare. Right in the middle of the disk, I got this fantastic full halo CME coming right towards us. I'm measuring speeds like 2,500 kilometers a second. I said, this thing's going to be here within 24 hours, and I'll bet my mortgage on it. <laughs> you know, so I had, I we put out, we put out a prediction then for that uh, of an A100 K9 storm. Uh, I remember saying, if not now, when? So when we looked at that situation with that storm, and it was, you know, for, by some measures the biggest storm of the last cycle, 18 hours in advance, we nailed it. So, you know, when people say you're, you know, you're, you're decades behind the weather service, yeah, okay, so weather service, we can see a hurricane five days out and fairly well track it towards the east coast. Sometimes we blow it, sometimes not, but we can see it five days out. Okay, so we can't do that. So the, 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 the gaps, of course, uh, you know, and, and I'm sure you have opinions on this, where are we? with our ability to recognize when a particular sunspot group is going to erupt or when or how that sunspot group is going to evolve. I remember, for example, back in the last cycle, there was one day when we, well, I think it was the October time frame. There was a couple of times it happened. I think it was maybe October the 21st. We said uh, it was 1% because we never say never. 1% chance of a big flare in the next three days. And I remember we do on the, the kind of, we sometimes we'll do two week forecasts, we'll be talking to customers. And the, on that particular day, at 20 to the 21st, thereabouts, there was no spots in the sun. Ten days later, all hell broke loose. 
we had three of the largest sunspot groups of the cycle all on the visible disk and at no point obviously 10 days earlier did we ever know that could happen it was going to happen so certainly from that perspective you know we, we were, were totally lost in our ability to understand um, what's going to happen 10 and the same applies today what's going to happen 10 days from now on the sun where what spots will emerge how big how, when does the spot stop growing at 100 millions 500 millions or up to the behemoths when they get up over 2,000 uh, millions you know we, we, we don't know so much yet so there's so many areas and opportunities for for, for, uh, for the research um, but so the, so the answer is that it's vague I know there's some things I think we're very good at and of course there's some things where, where we have a long way to go no, I, I, I definitely agree. Um, I mean, if you if you think about the, you know, we we've, we've talked about the, the range of scales in terms of spatial scales and temporal scales and the complexity of the physics. You know, we're we're tackling very different kinds of a problem than than the lower atmospheric weather community is, is tackling. And uh, you know, we we have more terms in our equations. You know, if if, if you know, in a, if you want to speak in a simplified manner, and and you know. Even trying to get the initial conditions, for example, for our models is such such so much more challenging task. We have a vast base that is currently very you know sparsely sampled, so you know the the size of the problem is completely different. So I mean sometimes I I, I feel like it's you know it, it's it's not a fair comparison even to to make you know to say that that we're decades behind. Uh, it's really the uh, the, uh, the the nature of the problem that we're trying to tackle is is you know really fundamentally very different. That's that's absolutely right. I mean, some people will t you know, will tell you whenever I mean some of these things are so complex that it's hard to imagine if we ever get there. Another example would be the 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 um, spectrum of a proton, a particle event, it makes such a difference to how it's going to affect us here on Earth, but why did that X1 flare produce you know, a huge 100 MeV event when the X17 did not? You know, I'm not sure. Um, it'll be many years, I think, before we get to a point where we can do some of this stuff. And you hit on a, a key piece, and that is the observations, the the, the, the sampling. Uh, I, sometimes I tell people, imagine sitting in 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 somewhere, say, in Atlanta, uh, and you're going to make your forecast on Atlanta based on a single sounding from a location in Montana. <laughs> that's know? right. Yeah. That, that's where we're at here. Mm -hmm. If you look at every day, if I have my background is meteorology, and you can see that, that I don't know how many samples, 50 or 100 or something, over North America alone, where we, we use balloons and everything, we're sampling the atmosphere. Up to you know so 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 and so high up to a hundred thousand feet whatever, and, and and have a tremendous understanding of the the, 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 um, the spatially the, the environment that when, and obviously can then predict so much easier what what might happen. But space weather, gosh, we got a single spot out there in the uh, L1 and a couple of geo birds and yeah, long way to go. Well, look, Bill, um, we, we, we uh, all appreciate your class. I mean, I think this is extremely valuable information for the entire class, including myself here. And, and, and we, we really appreciate your, your help with this thing. So, um, and uh, hopefully we can get some of our students to come stop by there and then give, you know, really a, a, an institute kind of a tour over your facility there. Well, thanks, Santi. As you know, it's always a pleasure working with you, and uh, I thank you for the opportunity to, to, to work with the class here. And again, you're very welcome anytime to, to visit us here. So thank you very much. All right. Thanks very much, Bill. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye.